Hi everybody, it's Tom Woods. I'm here with Professor Jared Casey of University College Dublin. He is the author of Libertarian Anarchy Against the State. Wow, that is one seriously shocking title. <laughs> and today we're going to talk a little bit about, well, Ireland. He's come here from Ireland, uh, visiting the United States for a few days, and so I, I grabbed hold of him, got him on camera for you guys. And so we're going to talk about what type of, of example Ireland is for us when we talk about issues like this, when we're, we're talking about not just that the shoe industry should be privatized yeah. and not just that uh, maybe we should have vouchers for this. No, we're talking about real free market here mm -hmm. and applying it even in areas where we're told these are public goods that need to be provided by your wise overlords mm -hmm. who take your money from you. We're rejecting that whole way of thinking. Yeah. But where are the examples? Like, when has this actually been done? And you've been saying that Ireland is an example. So yeah. explain yourself. I Ireland is an example because uh, you know one of the strongest objections, perhaps the most basic objection to anarchism, is that anarchism we, we need law in order to have society, and the only way to have law is to have a state make it. And uh, so, to which I say, well, <laughs> you know, it's been done. Uh, it, so people say, how can we do this in the future? And I say, it's been done in the past. So the the law system uh, in Ireland from about five hundred. BC to about 1600 AD, that's just over 2,000 years, was not state-run. In fact, the entire society was organized on a private law basis. This is known in English as the Brehan Law. And the, what you had in each of the, Ireland was divided into a series of very small little kingdoms called Tuha, right? Um, so, I mean, it was, they're very small, so I'm the king from here down to the river. <laughs> okay, it was like that small. You're talking about 3,000 people, maybe 5,000 people. And the the legal system there was run by a family. A family made this their business. Uh, they specialized in, doing, in, in, in learning the laws and knowing what the laws and customs of that society were. And when there was a dispute, they, they adjudicated and they gave a decision. And, and therefore, and in order to maintain their business, of course, they had to be scrupulously fair. Because if they weren't, and then nobody had to go to them, you couldn't be subpoenaed. Um, now you might say, well, that's all very well. Okay, you can go to somebody and, and get a decision, but what happens if you lose and you give the, you know, you make rude gestures and so on? Well, the answer is they had a very effective system um, that before you went to law, before the case was heard, you had to actually give sureties. I mean, you had to make a sort of deposit or take out a bond in modern and so on, so that when the case went against you, the bond was simply forfeit, and that's how uh, the system worked. For more serious cases involving what we now think of as criminal actions. Again, the, um, the idea here is that criminal, criminal uh, activities weren't offences against the state. There aren't any such things as offences against the state. The state is not offended by anything I do. It's individuals who are offended. Right. If I steal from somebody, that's that person's property I've stolen. If I kill somebody, it's, those, it's that person's relatives who are offended. So the, 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 the payment was, by and large, uh, uh, a payment of a surety, uh, even in the case of homicide. You, the equivalent thing would have been uh, in Anglo-Saxon England would have been the, uh, uh, the, the, the money, the man money as they called it, that you paid for it. Now, the, the aggrieved family didn't have to accept it. They could have insisted on a, on a more severe penalty. But again, the community as, as a whole has an interest in preventing bloodshed. So by and large, the, the payment was extraordinarily large and depending on your status, very large. Now, the, the way this worked in, in uh, traditional society was that your kinship group were effectively your insurance agency. When you operated in society, you were, you were backed by your kinship group. And if you would, couldn't or wouldn't pay, your kinship group ended up paying for you. Now, what that meant is that when a decision went against you, if you couldn't pay, your kinship group had to pay. And if you were a recidivist, and they were mm. making a lot of payments, where did the pressure come on you to behave? It came from your own kinship group. In the end, if you really were an outrageous re-offender, they would say, we disclaim all responsibility for you. He's on his own. He's not a member of any kinship group. We, we, we won't back him in any way. Now you're without insurance and you can't operate in the society with them without kinship insurance. And you would be declared an outlaw. And if you're an outlaw, anyone may kill you and there will be no payment to make. Nobody will prosecute. Now, let me put this to you. If, if an outlaw decision goes against you, would you A, go down to the local pub and drink for three days, okay? Or would you be hightail it out of there? And the answer is you would hightail it out of there. So effectively, it was a sentence of banishment from your community. And that's how it worked. Now, the, if I'm understanding you correctly, the, the point of raising this 
and indeed other episodes in history in your book, is not to say we're going to, obviously, it's not to say we're <laughs> no. going to adopt this root and no. branch. No, no. So what is the point of race? Well, the point is, A, first of all, to demonstrate, uh, albeit historically, that legal systems without, without the state have existed in the past. Indeed, they were the norm. Uh, in not just in Irish society, but in, in Anglo-Saxon and in, in German, in all traditional societies, this is how they worked. In fact, this is how it worked in Roman law for, for the most part. Roman law was almost completely, almost completely private law. I remember when I first started looking at Roman law, I was shocked. I was looking for all the, the public law stuff and I couldn't find it. And that's because there's very little of it. Okay, now it moves in that direction, of course, once you move from the Republic to the Principate. Okay, and the emperor starts doing it, and then you start, he starts effectively making edicts and, and all of the rest, and it begins to look a lot, like, a lot more like what we have. Right? But, but from the foundation of, the, of, of Rome, certainly uh, up to the fall, of, up to the, uh, sorry, the, the end of the Republic, and even for a hundred years afterwards, almost all Roman law is private law, and it operates in this way. If two Romans had a dispute, who was the judge? The, the praetor, who was the, the chief legal officer in the Roman Republic, had a list. Right? So if you and I had a dispute, we could A, agree on another citizen to be the judge, and if we agreed, that was fine. If we couldn't, the praetor took the, the first guy off the list. So the judge in our case was just another citizen, not a specialist legal mm -hmm. representative or, or somebody empowered in any particular way, but just, if you like, a peer, somebody who, who shared our interests and so on and who would judge between us. So the point then is to show that this has been possible in the past and what has been done can be done. Now, I'm not saying, of course, that we, we want to simply transpose what we had in the past into the future. That's not going to work. And one of the reasons why it wouldn't work um, as it did it then is, of course, that kinship groups don't exist in the same way. So that yeah. system of surety provision simply couldn't work because we don't have kinship groups. And indeed, it would that would, I would think, <laughs> to put it mildly, that it would violate libertarian <laughs> uh, axioms, to put it mildly. But there's a very simple way of dealing with this. You simply substitute insurance. Just as, for example, in certain activities, before people will engage with you, you have to be bonded. In other words, you have to post a bond so that in the event of your failure to do something, the bond is there and they can get a recompense. So in, I'm, I'm now I'm, only, I'm, not, I'm not exactly making this up as, as I go along, but it's just one way in which this could work, is that in, if you wanted to operate in, in, in a libertarian society, one way in which you could ensure that people would deal with you is if you were bonded. To the extent that you weren't, or inadequately bonded, then people would have to be prepared to take a risk in dealing with you. you know, they'd have to make a judgment that the uh, advantages or rewards or profits were great enough to warrant the risk right. and take a chance. So something like that could, if you like, pr uh, I think in a libertarian way, provide the same function as the kinship groups. Can you say something really brief about what the law merchant was and is that a helpful oh, example? Yeah. Well, no, the law merchant is a brilliant idea because um, in, in medieval Europe you, you had multiple oh, hundreds of competing little polities all over Europe and so on. So suppose you lived in, in, uh, in uh, Portugal, let's say that you lived in Lisbon, and uh, somebody wanted to get you to deliver a shitload of wine, say, to Rotterdam. Okay, you say, well, hey, I mean, if I send this off and he doesn't pay or he disappears, that's a shitload of wine gone down the, the tubes and I don't get any money. Um, so merchants devised a little system of credit checks, as it were. So you would go down to your local credit agency, as it were, merchant agency, and say, I've got a letter from Minier van Breda in Rotterdam. He wants me to send a shipload of wine. Can I do it? And they say, yeah, we've got records. He dealt with so-and-so and so-and-so, and you, and you do that. Now, the advantage of that, of course, is that it's international. It doesn't require a, a, a cumbersome legal mechanism to deal with. Um, you, you can cheat, but you can cheat once, yeah. right? Okay, so if you want to cheat, you've got to cheat big. But hey, again, you've got to be really stupid to really to send, you know, to engage in a big business operation with somebody who has no record of business. Right. So typically, you've got to, it's like, you know, like eBay today or an, an internet, you've got to build up your, your credit rating and then people will deal with you. If you don't, it wouldn't work. But you, you had even, the, there was a simpler system in, in the fairs that took place, for example, in England and France. In England, um, you know, where fairs came together for a day and you had merchants d dealing with each other and with the public, they had what they called pie powder courts. And that's from the French, pied poudre, which means dusty feet. Because you travel there and you got dust on your feet. And they had very strict rules. In order to participate in the fair, you had to agree to abide by the decisions of the court. The decisions, the case had to be heard and the decision given and the remedies paid before you left. That was speedy justice, yeah, okay? Yeah. But that ensured that when people came, they, they, they came with the, the guarantee, if you like, that justice 
even if it was relatively summary and speedy, was going to be done. The Lord Merchant, if you like, operated over a longer period of time and so on. But uh, that's, that's the way, by and large, the commercial law developed. And I mentioned uh, the commercial law, which developed from the 12th and 13th century through trading groups like the Hanseatic League and others, was adopted effectively wholesale by many of the systems, including the common law system in the 19th century. I think that about does it. That is a, that's, <laughs> I would say you have given a satisfactory <laughs> answer. And, and if you want more information, you've got to read Libertarian Anarchy by Jared Casey. And you can visit us. I have a special page about these sorts of topics featuring uh, Professor Casey's book, libertyclassroom.com slash Casey. And of course, Professor Casey teaches all the cool libertarians, thousands of them, teaches them at libertyclassroom.com where they're listening to him uh, on their computers, on their iPods, and whatever, and you can be part of that by but joining us. Not in us their there. cars. Not in their <laughs> His course is too hard to do in your car. The other ones, like the one I do, you can drive around, you can be in a coma, it's fine. But, but his, you got to sit down and study. But uh, thanks for being with us, Professor Casey. Not at all. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Much. We'll see you over there at libertyclassroom.com/slash Casey. Get your brain moving, it's going to explode with all this information. See you around. <laughs>